Hey everybody, welcome to the Patty G Show. I am your host, Patty G. We are here on site at Building 5 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Today's guest is Merrill Kennedy of Kennedy Rice Mills. We're going to be learning about the agriculture industry, rice farming, technology, some connection she has to Kellogg's. Who knows what we're going to get into. But before we get into that, I want to give a big, wonderful shout out and thank you to the amazing folks that bring you this show each and every week. Horizon Financial Group, Falaya Real Estate, Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge, Lake Men's Health Center. You know our outfit is brought to you by McClavey Limited, and our location is Building 5 Restaurant here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Without further ado, Meryl, welcome to the show. Thank you, Patty G. Glad to be here. I'm so excited to learn more about your business, what y'all have going on, and ultimately just everything technology. I hear y'all are big into tech over there at Kennedy Rice Mills. Well, you know, technology is a journey for um, for sure, but we have been moving in the right direction, I think. And um, it's a little bit slower, I feel like, from an agricultural perspective in some ways, but we're excited about what the future has to bring for agriculture. Good. So for those that may not be aware, who are you and what the heck do you do? Yeah, so Merrill Kennedy, I am the owner and um, CEO of Kennedy Rice Mill. Um, family business, right? There actually is four daughters, um, farm, farm family. My father started as a farmer. And so, you know, we have been taking rice from the field to a finished product for a long time now. Um, actually take rice from, from the ground, you know, from the seed level through, um, through the dryers, milling, distri- dist- distribution. And then now we actually have our own brand called Four Sisters. So, okay. Yeah. So you used to grow up going through the fields with your dad and riding along in the tractors with him. I mean, walk us us through that childhood of living out in the the farm. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting how people um, are amazed by, you know, what it is like to live in a rural area. But the town I'm from, Marouge, Louisiana, up there on the northeast corner, you've probably never heard of it, north of Monroe, um, about 500 people, really very special place, right? 500? 500 people. So, Holy yeah, it's it's a very, it's not even really a town. It's actually a village. <laughs> um, so it truly does take a village to raise a child, I guess. But, you know, my father loved farming, still loves farming. Um, that's really in the root of who he is and what he loves to do and loves to be outside. And so when you have four daughters, you know, you just make do with what you got is what I, is what I always tell people. And he didn't hesitate to take us out there and to really teach us about, you know, what um, agriculture meant to him, what the land value is, and how to take care of the land. And so there was many weekends spent just riding around in a pickup truck um, with him, you know, with me in the back seat, really, with one of my um, Harry Potter books, frankly, you know, thinking, when are we going to be done? But <laughs> I'm so grateful Um for many of those moments now, you know, when I look back and just that slower pace of life, frankly. Yeah, it's a whole lot slower and laid back, but at the same time, you know what you're doing is so important to not only your family, but kind of the economy as a whole when it comes down to farming. I mean, that's what everything else is rooted around. I mean, we've got food on the table here tonight that we're going to be enjoying in a little bit, and it's, you can't have food without farmers, you know? Yeah. No, you can't. I think some people just think they walk into a grocery store and food, you know, comes from the <laughs> fairy godmother or something. But the, um, you know, really the chain too, right? I think we all during COVID were were made aware of just how fragile that supply chain can be, and it really does start with the farmers, right? It starts at the at the ground level and then works its way up. So there's a lot of people involved in putting food on this table, you know, all the way to the people that you know prepared it for us in the back tonight. So. I thought it was awesome that you decided to bring me here. I've never been to this place, but it's incredible. I'm going to be back, so I'm looking forward to <laughs> trying some yummy things. It's a little far of a drive from North Louisiana to get down here just for dinner, though. You know, you'd be surprised what people from the country do. You'd be surprised. <laughs> it's just the the far the, a country mile is a whole lot further than a city mile. You're absolutely right on that one. You're absolutely right. So growing up, y'all were had your family farm, but then along the way, you and your sisters, at some point, did y'all foresee that y'all were going to take it over? Was it 
kind of ingrained in you. How did that process happen from, you know, growing up to in the back of a pickup truck reading Harry Potter to one day saying, I'll be the CEO of this organization that my dad runs? Yeah, you know, I think it was a little different for all four of us. And each of us has kind of our own storyline when it comes to that. But our father always did really encourage us. And I don't, you know, know that necessarily he wanted four daughters. But um, at the same time, he never really was shy about, you know, really encouraging us our, you know, entire life. Hey, come back, you know, you can work for me, those kind of things. Um, for me personally, I had no desire to come back, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> what was your I path? was out of that small town as just fast as I could get. Um and I ended up going to the University of Georgia and graduation, graduating in international affairs. Thought I was going to, you know, move abroad. I mean, I was, I was That's a big long, shift. long gone, frankly. Um, and he told me that he was not going to pay for me to get my master's unless okay. I worked for him for a summer. And so, you know, it, I thought at the time, at 21 years old, I'm like, this is a great deal. I'm going to hate being back in, you know, little town, Louisiana. And, you know, I'll get my graduate degree paid for. And that's, that's a big win because I had no idea how I was going to pay for it. <laughs> and so what I didn't realize when I came back is just really what he was doing. You know, I always just saw him as the farmer on the tractor, very similar to probably how we all think of agriculture, right? So there's this preconceived notion of a man in overalls, you know, maybe with a, d a dip in or something, you know, piece, ride, piece of ride, yeah, mouth, exactly, you know. riding on the tractor, and that's really not agriculture at all, right? I mean, it's it's very much um, a global business, and so you know, all of a sudden, I saw it very different. The fact that you know, here he was, you know, making trades on the Chicago board, and you know, talking to people overseas, and you know booking, um, you know, booking commodities for the previous year. And yes, I mean, a lot of it was plans for the next upcoming crop season and those kind of things. But it was um, fascinating really to see him in a different light, right? Not just the weekend dad that I got, you know, doing the thing he loved to do, but um, on, on an everyday kind of work, work basis. And so I really fell in love with the business um, and I had decided, well, you know, uh, maybe I want to try this out, so I stuck around. <laughs> I don't think I thought that, you know, over a decade later I'd still be here. But, um, you know, it was a, it was, it was a good, it was a good deal, and um, I've loved working with my father. And it's been, it's been a wild ride. And so, you know, the idea behind Four Sisters um, was to really get the whole family back involved and to do something together. And my my brother-in-law was already running our farming operation, and so it has been super cool journey to work with them and, and really for all of us to kind of be together as a family and, um, and to be able to share that experience. And now, you know, our product's in 5,000 stores nationwide or Holy something smokes. like that. Yeah, so for, you know, just starting the brand a few years ago, we've really made a lot of progress. So, so and you didn't think that that one summer was going to turn into what it is today. You know, 10 years in the family business and just doing everything that you are as of now. No, I had I had no idea. Um, again, I really didn't think that I would enjoy living in Rouge. Again, I didn't feel like I would like farming. Um, didn't seem like, you know, it was something that I could even really see myself doing. And you got to imagine there was really no women in agriculture even when I was growing up, right? And so there was no examples of what I was supposed to wear or what I was supposed to act like. Or I think um, the first week on the job, my father told my mom that I need, she needed to go buy me some khakis, you know? <laughs> um, well, I mean, what were you wearing before I, Yeah, well, so, um, so just, you know, little things like that. And then now to see the journey of so many more women coming back into agriculture and um, participating in different ways and getting involved in all, all parts of the, you know, food world, right? Not just as on the farm level, but throughout all parts. So that's been incredible, frankly, over the last decade, so much has changed and I've been a part of a lot of that. So, um, really exciting. Yeah. That's, it's, it's interesting to see the, the business side of farming, uh, separately than just the actual farming itself. You know, I grew up in 
I did not really grow up, but I lived my high school years and college years in Sunshine, Louisiana. Okay. So out by St. Gabriel and not nearly the farming life that y'all have up in North Louisiana. But they did corn, they did Absolutely. soybeans, and I would throw hay every summer. Yeah. And that was my summer job was throwing hay and getting familiar with all the, the horse farms, the hay farms and everything. So it's interesting to see the whole process from seed to harvest and how much effort goes into that. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy job by any stretch of the imagination. And we're only seeing one end of it out in the field. We're not even seeing the business side of things, yeah. which I'm sure has a whole other animal that you've got to tackle at that point. No doubt. Um, but I do think it's so important for young people to get that kind of experience, right? To really kind of understand um, what it takes to um, get food on the table. Yeah. And to have kind of the, that um, working experience, I think that's cool that your that your family let you do that. That's that's really great. Yes, I mean that. Look, agriculture is big risk, right? That's just the bottom line to it. Um, it's a big risk to be a farmer. You're laying your life on the line with Mother Nature that you can't control every single day. Um, the cost of inputs are extremely high right now, especially with the war raging on. Right, so um, this crop year will be, you know, one of the one of the record highs as far as what it takes to just put a crop in the ground. So farmers take huge financial risk. I don't think they get enough credit for that. Um, and, you know, our commodities in general, like rice, you know, people want to make sure their food remains cheap. So there's not huge margins. So, yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a, um, a business that survives on a lot of grit, right? All right. the way through the supply chain, just like you that summer. So I think I think it teaches you some valuable lessons, though, about um, just you know what you can do and, and how um, how powerful you know people really are at the end of the day and, and um, survival, right? You, yeah, survival yeah, of the fittest. It's a, in the survival. <laughs> well, you know, a farmers not going to let their crop go bad, right? They're they're um, they're going to get out there no matter what time of day. If it's the weekend, um, if it's a holiday. If the rains come in, they're they're going to be out there. So yeah, and they're going to be making sure that they doing whatever they got to do. Absolutely. So whenever y'all were thinking about bringing the family back together and starting four sisters, how was that changing the existing landscape of Kennedy Mills? Yeah. So we built um, Kennedy Rice Mill in 2012. Is when we actually started milling rice there in Marouge, and so that really reshaped kind of our business in general. Honestly, we until then. Um, you know, had been operating some other mills, but had never, never really owned our own mills. So we built that plant from the ground up and started doing a lot of bulk business, right? So we were, we've been shipping rice internationally. Um, you mentioned Kellogg's at the beginning of this conversation, but they were one of our early, um, early customers, right? And still are a great customer of ours. And then we do business with a lot of people like Hazard Bush, and Mars, and a lot of the big guys. A lot of our products end up in Walmart, right? So we were selling rice really to a lot of large CPG companies in bulk. And then they were either further processing it or putting it into a bag. And they wanted to tell our story. Like they wanted to come to the farm and, you know, really show what farming actually looks like now, right? It doesn't look like that person that I even imagined as a right. child, right? Maybe it looks a little different, um, a.k.a. me. <laughs> so, you know, it was... Incredible to have them out there to the farm to teach them to show them have them tell their customers but we really weren't telling the story from our own narrative and so from our own perspective and from you know from that light right and so we've really felt like okay well maybe it's the time to start our own brand where we can really tell that personal journey um, in a way that's authentic right and in a way to kind of maybe spice up the rice aisle a little bit and so that was really the, the idea is take a little grain and make a big difference in the world um, and, you know, do that in an authentic manner. And, and that's who we are. You know, we're four farm daughters. We're four sisters, right? Right. <laughs> that's, that's an easy name it's, for it's, yeah, Absolutely. And it tells that story kind of up there in your face, you know, in a way that allows you to kind of relate to the family. And, I mean, just like you and I are doing right now, food is about sharing, right? It's about the family table. It's about enjoying with people that you love and and um that can be family that can be friends um it can be wider range right but that's it brings us together as right. humanity it really does well, and especially in like south or in louisiana in general absolutely it's like, it is part it, of our it's, culture yes. it, it's part of our culture yes. it is what people 
are looked forward to on the weekends. They look forward to family functions where they're going to have a meal. They mm-hmm. talk about what are you going to cook? What are you bringing? What's your dish? You know, we've got Easter upcoming. People are talking about what they're cooking. Looking forward to a Friday crawfish bowl during Lent. Like it's a Louisiana tradition mm-hmm. to gather around food and just enjoy each other's company. I mean, it's one of the things that makes Louisiana special, in my opinion. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And it's not just the fact that our food is, frankly, probably the best in the world. Um, <laughs> but it's also because of that camaraderie that you're talking about, right? That that kind of shared. And, you know, you can solve a lot of the world's problems if you'll just come together every once in a while and um, be able to kind of relate with different people. And, you know, until, until um, COVID, we actually had a lady in our office that cooked lunch for everybody every day and we would sit around and we would all eat together right that was kind of part of part of the culture of our company and then of course COVID kind of ruined that for everybody um but again like the the message is still the same which is you know if you can break bread with somebody then you can figure out um a lot of your differences and put aside a lot of things yeah and it's I like doing a, a business lunch, right? Because mm-hmm. if you can break bread with somebody, you're more than likely going to be able to figure out a way to do business. Together. Absolutely. And, you know, it's that e- eating a meal is that that intimate moment where you go with that other person. And y'all are kind of sharing this shared experience, coming to get. Even if you're having like an appetizer or a drink or something, it's something. you're still sharing something again. Something. So walk us through the Kellogg situation because y'all done a big deal with them, right? Yeah, so, you know, it was incredible, but they, um, we've done several, several promotional um, projects with, with Kellogg's, a um, few that have been kind of in recent, recent years, but the biggest one has been an ingrained program, actually, is, is the name of it, and essentially we have been working with them to reduce carbon um, from rice emissions, so methane gas emissions, and it's been super exciting to be kind of part of because it was, a pilot program, um, and then again, we're repeating it this year, but we've actually proven that we can reduce methane gas emissions in rice production, so that's pretty, that's pretty incredible, pretty incredible <laughs> right? And they were really one of the first to say, okay, we're going to kind of step out there and put some dollars to where our mouth is on these topics, right? ESG is a big topic for all these large CPG companies, um, and everybody has their sustainability plans, and a lot of people are focused on rice as, as part of that sustainability journey. But they were really the ones that are, you know, at the forefront trying to solve some of these some of these big issues, frankly, and using technology to your point to be able to do that. So, Regrow and Syngenta were also part of um, the team with Kellogg's and ourselves, and they provided, you know, heat maps and you know, looking at you know weather related patterns and how emissions you know plays into all that. So, well above my head when it comes to science, but super. Super grateful to be part of that program. And then from that, they actually, um, you know, told that story to a lot of their consumers and then featured Four Sisters on the back of one of their Kellogg's Rice Krispie um, treat boxes. So, and some of their other cereal boxes as well. They launched a new homestyle treat at Walmart. If y'all haven't tried it, it's, it's kind of phenomenal. I think I have four um, packs in my car right now. <laughs> it's not good to be pregnant and be around a bunch of Rice Krispie treats. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but, um, Look, you, you got to eat what you well, got to eat. You know, I, I, um, there, you know, I, I have to say TikTok says that they, they, uh, you should eat one before you work out. So they're not all bad. They actually are a nice kind of little treat pick me up, but not when you eat as many as I do, probably. <laughs> quality control. Quality that, that's, control. That's always the argument. Quality, quality control. control every time. That's right. But, in, in all honesty, it's been it's been exciting because we've been able to kind of work with each other. You know, they've been able to promote us, and then we've been able to promote, you know, their sustainability goals to their customers. And, again, tell the story of women in agriculture, right? And that's, you know, they have large producer that's actually female-owned. And so I think it's been, it's been incredible and I'm um, really appreciative of that relationship. Yeah, I mean, that's getting to that point. I mean, were y'all were these contracts kind of already in place when y'all came into the picture? Or were y'all kind of pivotal in getting these connections to these large productions or making that sustainability happen? Yeah. So we um, when we built the mill in 2012, I think we gained Kellogg's as a customer in like 13 or 14. So we worked really hard to gain them as a customer, and then just through the years, we've just built you know and deepened that relationship with them. And um, our network, you know, we, we grow some of the medium grain for their products, and then we have a network of farmers that also grows that medium grain. 
And so they just look at us um, when they're thinking about new innovation or sustainability or, um, you know, different kind of programs that they're working on. And so, again, throughout the years, we've been able to work on several, several big projects with them. What was that like around the dinner table when y'all were able to make the announcement, we got the Kellogg's account? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, to me, that's going to be huge. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you've been on it every year. So every year it's like that. <laughs> You're like crossing your yeah, finger. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Every year it's a little bit like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, and look, that's, that's part of just my entrepreneurial journey in general is it's a little bit, you know, you always kind of stay hungry is what I tell people all the time, but, um, you never win an account forever. Right. And so, so you have to kind of always be working on that relationship, making sure that you're in the right place at the right time. And, um, I always tell entrepreneurs that or people that want to be entrepreneurs that is that you've got to be running, right? You always have to be. Um, and it's wonderful to celebrate the wins, but as soon as the, as soon as the win's over, you, you're out for the kill again. So Yeah, and it's, it's the process of getting that win, right? That's and right. That's the important part to focus on is how did you get the win, and then how can you replicate that process to continually get the wins? Because getting one win, is it's fleeting. Yeah. You, you know, if you get one account and you land it, You've got all your eggs in one basket. That's right. And then, you know, winning it is just the beginning, right? So it's showing up every day. It's making sure that you're doing the right thing for that customer, that, you know, operationally that we provide a quality product to them day in, day out, on time and full, on, you know, all the things that go into just making sure that, um, you know, we keep our customers happy. And so... And look, it's never it's never going to be a hundred percent perfect. Things happen, right? Um, again, we're dealing with a commodity too, so weather patterns and all kinds of things can affect thing you know your best laid plans. But I think again, those relationships and and staying true to your word and showing up every single day really makes the difference. Yeah, and being able to tell people that you're going to deliver, you absolutely, know, and then also having. To take the time, I'd imagine, on the business side to explain to some of the customers if it's late, why it's late. Because at the end of the day, there's some components that you just can't control. Uh, there's a lot of components that you, can, you can't control. And look, I mean, if everyone should know that after what we've experienced the last three years, oh right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. So um, if you haven't learned that lesson, then you've been living under a rock, I think. But there's a lot of things that are out of our control, and the best thing is, is communication Trying to do that um, in different ways, trying to use technology to communicate differently, either with its employees or customers or vendors, um, and it's a journey. Yeah. So you said earlier y'all have like a network of other farmers that y'all purchase crop from. Can you walk us through how do you get those relationships, how do you find them, and what does that look like? Yeah, so we have been pulling um, kind of from our, what we call our network of farmers for a long time. A lot of them have been in our network for many years. Before we were in milling, we actually had dryers and then we would ship rough rice, as, you know, abroad to Mexico predominantly. Um, so, you know, we've been working with a group of farmers for a long time. And then now, you know, it's, we're really working with my generation, right? A lot of the dads are still involved that were worked with my father. So that's been cool to see too. It's also been really great to see that we have so many young farmers coming back to Marooch. So, you know, Marouge is not a dying town. It's, it's really kind of a little vibrant little town. Um, a, lot of, a lot of young people that are, you know, coming back to the farm. So that's extremely exciting. That's awesome. Extremely exciting to see because you just don't see that in all of rural America, honestly. It's, it, you know, can become a real struggle to get young people to come back to the farm. Well, it's, I mean, it's like what you said whenever you were going to come back for the summer. You still had these, you had these different ambitions, in the sense that you wanted to go and get your master's, Absolutely. you wanted to go and do this, and then it was through having to spend a summer in the town, in the farming field, in the business, that you came to recognize the value of it, and ultimately the satisfaction you got from working in the family business. I mean, that's family entrepreneurs and family businesses, they're always going to face that reality, that you can go out, explore on your own, figure out what you want to do, but if given the chance or kind of forced into the chance to yeah. work for the family business, you're going to recognize like this is, you see why it's carried on for so long and being able to then say, hey, we made it another generation with the family farm. Oh, it's extremely rewarding. Um, and, you know, I think, I think in general, agriculture really is 
a business that is passed on a lot of times, you know, from one generation to the next generation. And so when there, when you don't see as many people coming back to the farm level, it is frankly a little scary because, you know, there's just not that, you don't really get taught in school, oh, go, go be a farmer, right? Right. So there's not a lot of people, <laughs> there's not a lot of people that choose that career path that didn't grow up in it either. Yeah. So it's even a little bit more complicated from that perspective and the fact that, you know, if we don't, if we don't have kind of that pool of people that want to stay in rural America or want to come back to the family farm, or frankly, I mean, maybe they just have ambitions to be in agriculture and they, maybe they just, they don't have connections, right? But right. that there's a path for them to come into agriculture, I think is a big deal. So, and we were talking a little bit beforehand on kind of an avenue, I think that'd be beneficial to get them interested in agriculture. And you were talking about, you were going to do your own podcast. Yes, yes. So during COVID, I really uh, had to adjust the way I, we talked about communication, right? But I had to adjust the way we communicate with employees um, in particular. And then that kind of went on to um, vendors and customers. And so doing a lot more video type things, trying to, trying to kind of, you know, be on Facebook as far as like little video messages and encouragements, because I just wasn't seeing anybody, right? I wasn't able to have that face-to-face interaction. And Zoom is great with my personal team, but, you know, we have a lot of employees that would never see me on a Zoom call, right? Because they're just, they're not connected in that way to me. So um, I started doing a lot more just kind of different types of communication, trying to figure out what worked and what didn't work. And that really led me to the podcast, and and we started a podcast called Rice Up Your Bowl. Now, I have to tell you, I have total admiration for you, as I told you, because it is a lot of work running a, pa- a podcast, and so I haven't been that diligent um, in recent months, frankly, but we do plan to kind of get it going again and, and try to um, move the ball forward, because I do think that it's a really good way to bring people to the farm, right? Right. And to get that audience that maybe doesn't understand rural life. And so the whole idea behind it was, you know, it was about the rice up your bowl, right? So, you know, being rice at the center, but also family and health and, you know, the kind of journey to holistically um, be like a whole person and spiritual health and all those things. And so that's kind of in a way to me what, what rural life is, you know, I always tell people I don't need to go, you know, to the spa and relax because I mean, you know, my backyard is, is it's a relaxing, it's a relaxing place. Right. <laughs> so I, I do think that it helps for people that live in um, a metro area to be able to relate to somebody that maybe lives a little bit different from them. I know that I love to come down here and enjoy y'all's good food and eat out with y'all. Right. And I enjoy city life, and so I think that other people would enjoy country life if they had the opportunity. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So. And, like, any time I, I go back to my parents and go back to the farm and being able to go out in the pastures with my son now, and he can see the cows, he can see the chickens, and we go and pick eggs and do that, that, re- that slow down kind of life. You know, when you get out there, it's like everything else is gone. You, yeah. don't, like, you don't hear anything. You don't hear the noises yeah, of the city. Pe- people do. The noise The noise thing is um, is hard for people sometimes, just yeah. how quiet it is. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, when we first moved there, my dad came downstairs, and he was like, you'll hear that. And we're like, no, Dad, we hear no. We don't hear anything. He's like, that's the point, and that's the beauty of being out here, is that it's just peaceful. It's, it's quiet. quiet. And it's ultimately, you I mean, you can... You can go out and just kind of lose yourself in your thoughts and have that relaxation, that recentering, that refocusing moment that is, is tough to get in the city because everything is always running a mile a minute. Everybody's always trying to do something and everybody's working at all hours of the day. There's no sun up to sun down, you're working, right? You know, right. And for the agriculture business, there is a little bit of that, except when it comes time to harvest. I've seen them out there way late oh, in the yeah. evening and Look, way when, early when in the morning. When it's harvest, they're going to do everything they can to get that crop out, right? So, or, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if there's weather coming in or some some kind of event. But there definitely is a slower pace of life, right? There's just not as much to do, to your point. You know, there's not a party to go to every night or a restaurant to go to. I always tell people that, you know, you have to learn how to cook or you're just not going to eat, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you can only eat so many microwavable meals. I guess you could continue to eat that. But, you know, you, you kind of have to learn how to cook. You have to learn how, you know, to 
kind of survive on a, on a slower pace. And um, it does bring you a lot of joy, I think. I, frankly, COVID really, really made me appreciate it. I was yeah. traveling a lot before COVID, and so I wasn't in Marouge as much. But um, since then, I've been able to really live in Marouge. I always have lived there, right? But just really live there, slow down, and enjoy kind of life there. And I have loved to, you know, really learn to love it even more. When I think COVID, that was one of the best things that happened in COVID was the slowdown of life on a global scale, right? Absolutely. And everybody had to slow down to some extent. Mm -hmm. You couldn't travel as much. You couldn't go to meetings as much, at least in person. And for some businesses, the shutdowns were terrible and all that. But from like a, when you look at it, and I'm sure there's going to be tons and tons of studies done now that people are kind of coming out of it and getting on the other side. But when you look back at the moments of staying at home and working and what that really brought to the surface in some people's marriages and some people's relationships, I was fortunate in the sense that my wife and I loved working at home together, but I know some people weren't. And maybe it was that reevaluation of, okay, are we in the right place? Absolutely. Can we only deal with this perfect person for four hours a day <laughs> and on the weekends? Do I even you know? really like them that much? Do I, exactly. Do I like them that much? And we saw it in the construction industry. People recognized, I don't like my kitchen or I don't like my den. I'm going to do renovations. I'm going to repair. I'm going to do this to my house, do that to my house. And it's it was a time where everybody kind of had this pumping the brakes on business and really reflecting on their personal life that they didn't have leading up to COVID. You know, yeah, you didn't have time. Yeah, there was no time. There was no time to really even think about it. Um, I know my daughter was really, she was young at the time. It happened like two-ish. And I really feel like it was a super big value that I was at home with her more at that time because her speech really was behind. And it um, it really, you know, was I was able to kind of get her speaking better and just interacting more, right? So I, I'm very grateful for that. For many ways. So now she won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> you get given some give and take there. Give a and take. Bit. I, I, but I'm, you know, I, I'd rather that than the opposite. Yeah, hundred percent. And so I think what y'all, I mean, I would, I would love to see y'all, y'all show kind of come to light and kind of keep pushing on because I think the power of showcasing the agriculture industry through content, whether it's through a podcast, through video form, even just social media posts. Showing people that side of things, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Clarkson's Farm mm -hmm. on Amazon Prime, like the power, did y'all see an impact here in the States because of what they were doing with that show? You know, I've never really put the two and two together, but I'm sure that there's some impact that yeah. that's real from that, frankly. Oh, I, I would I would not doubt it. I mean, if anything, it got people thinking and seeing the other side of the farming world, the struggles that people have to go through and... Ultimately, it's like if you are a farmer, how much risk is involved in that? How much betting that you're putting on the field, on the ground, and how much attention to detail comes into that? You know, it's if that did anything in the education and sending out content like that, it shows people just how intelligent and brilliant people in the agriculture industry are. Yeah, we're not um, the slow farmers. <laughs> no, gosh, no. And it's, no. And, and it's, I think, like, like you said, that perception of a farmer. Hey, look, I'm even guilty, right? I yeah. mean, we're all guilty of perceptions, and um, you can even grow up and you can still be guilty of that, um, you know, preconceived notion. Right. And, you know, most farmers do love to be out there on their tractor, right? And that's not a bad thing. That's, you know, that's what they want to do on the weekends. That's not necessarily what they do. That's just, you know, one, one thing they do. Right. And a multitude of many. And the, the size of the farms, I know that y'all y'all deal with, there's so much technology that goes into the pieces of equipment. It's not the old-time international <laughs> harvester, two two feet wide wheel no. with, with a single pole going down, and that's how you're, you're turning, no power steering. Like, that's that farmer is not that exist is, on that That is capacity. of the past. That is an ancient relic. It deserves a museum. Yes. <laughs> it deserves a museum. Yes. Now, we were we were asked to go to CES. I don't know if you're familiar with that show. It's a big technology show in Vegas um, in January as John Deere's guest. And so John Deere was the speaker that year. Um, their CEO was a keynote speaker. 
So it was a real honor to be there. In fact, um, when I got there, I realized, I think, just how big of an honor it was to be there. But they, they showcased a few of their farmer partners and, um, you know, talked about some of the precision agriculture that they were doing. And I think I think the idea is that really John Deere is a tech company now, right? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, they are. They're, that is insane. They are a tech company, 100% through and through. And so... It is not, um, it's not even an automobile company anymore. It, it's in the likes of like a Tesla, right, um, as far as as far as just what the technology can do right there in front of you on the tractor. And so, you know, we are continuing to learn how to use that technology better, frankly, and how to bring that into the business in a better way and how to use data better and how to um, really plan using the data. I think that that's a journey for most businesses right now because technology is moving so fast. And just making sure that you're fully utilizing it. But, you know, the equipment itself can do incredible things. And then just in general, you know, even the spray rigs, you know, I don't know if you if you um, are familiar with some of the new spray rig technology that John Deere has. But incredible in the fact that it can, like, literally, like, pinpoint the exact weed. Right, so you're not over. No, I'm not that familiar with the yeah. technology. Yeah, it, it's incredible, but um, you, that way, you know, you're not over spraying. You're not using too many chemicals, which is bad for the environment. Right, you're really reducing the amount of chemical usage that you're using, and then also reducing cost. Right, because one hundred percent, you know, chemicals are extremely expensive right now. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's helping the agriculture industry from every step and every facet. Whenever you look at the technology, you look at the data. And you look at the input of what you're getting from the machines and being able to, like you said, recognize, okay, no, we're going to spray. Like the machine knows where to spray and just the amount of all of that going into now you can cut your costs and now you can really look at the percentages. And like when you start getting into the numbers, it's like farming is now just looking at the numbers and the data and the statistics and knowing what you're going to do. Yeah. And there's already, um, you know, tractors that are driving themselves. So. Yeah, that's um, crazy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're not in widespread <laughs> use at this point. But I do think that, especially with, you know, frankly, agriculture struggles the most with labor. There's just not a lot of labor left on the farms, right? And so we need, as an industry, to figure out a way um, to, you know, utilize equipment that probably is not manpowered right? in the future. Especially, like, when I look out, like, 10 years, 15 years, and how we're going to continue to farm. So, you know, being able to have kind of that technology out there is huge wins. And then I'm, I'm sure um, you've been following some of this incredible new stuff they're doing with um, rural broadband exp expansion really across the country. Yep. But they're really trying to put an emphasis on agriculture. And I know even Louisiana is working on that, too. So making sure that we have broadband expansion into some of these really remote areas is super important because... Technology is really only as good as the internet that you have there. <laughs> yes. Other, otherwise, you're still kind of plug and play. Yeah. And we do struggle with that, um, you know, in some of our remote locations is that just being able to input data, you know, in a seamless way. So. And then whenever you have that ability to have the, the broadband and have the internet and the speeds, you now have another amenity of life. Oh, and no now doubt. you're now you're able to say you've got just as fast as internet in the city as you do out the city, regardless of what rural part of town or Louisiana you're in. And what that, in my eyes, does is it takes the younger generation and starts making them look, oh, maybe I can have a better way of life. You know, exactly. it's less expensive, um, a little bit slower pace. I, you know, you already saw a lot of young people start moving back to kind of more rural areas or even smaller cities over the last couple of years because they want a different pace of life. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think you'll see more people kind of choose a different style of um, living. And then with businesses being more and more open to remote working, no if you're in the city, doubt. and if you've got, you know, if you're married or you're in a relationship and one of the person, one of the people is in a, a business in the city and the other person is in agriculture, now you've got that flexibility where you can get the best of both worlds. Whereas beforehand, you'd have to drive into the city, you'd have to make the long commute, and it was not feasible for those that may have worked, you know, using Baton Rouge as my own knowledge example. Well, the traffic having to down drive here downtown, is terrible. Right. So going from like St. Gabriel to downtown Baton Rouge is a 45 hour, hour and a half, depending on where you're coming from, in the traffic. And like that for most people is too long of a commute yeah. to have. 
within the same quote unquote city, within the same city limits. But when you look at the ability now where you can possibly work for two hours from home and go in later past all the traffic and still have the great access to all of your connections, all of your work is still in front of you. It's, it's changing the landscape of rural life and rural development. And I think it's just going to be huge for what you'll have to do and allowing y'all to bring in tech that goes off Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, that, you know, again, one of the things I was so appreciative of during COVID was that we had actually gotten broadband in Marouge um, before some of this new broadband expansion. And so, you know, I realized that I could really do most of what I was doing from my, from my office, right? I mean, one moment, you know, I was talking to somebody in, you know, Mexico or overseas somewhere. And then the next moment, you know, I could be in Cincinnati. So all of a sudden I could, I could be in a lot of different places in one day. <laughs> and not have to hop on and a plane. And not have to hop on a plane. Yeah. So that, you know, that still is somewhat of a challenge. Um, you know, we have a fairly good airport in Monroe, but again, you know, travel is challenging now and it was then too. And it just, it just makes life a lot easier. And to your point, people, even that live in cities, you know, the commuting, you know, you have 24 hours in a day. If you spend two hours in your car, it's not a really fun way to spend a big percentage of your day. Yeah, and some people make the most of it. I know whenever I'm in a drive, I'm either listening to a podcast or an audio book or some form of an education component where I'm able to kind of continue my growth, continue my knowledge, and not still stuck with, you know, listening and not listening to music to just get through the drive. You Absolutely. Know? And some, there are some days where you just got to have the windows down, <laughs> blaring and jamming, but there's others when it's like you can take that time if you have a long commute to further advance and further develop your skill set through riding in the car. And so now instead of losing four hours, right, now you've gained four hours worth of education, but it is unfortunate to be away from your family if you've got one for that amount of time out of a given day because we're all given the same amount of time in a day. Oh, that's it. That's all we've got. So, time is the most valuable thing, Patty. <laughs> yes. Time, because you're not getting any more of it, you know. And so it's, it's, it's huge whenever you can recognize the ability to shift from having to fly to go to these meetings to saying, oh, I can Zoom and call them from wherever. It makes no I, difference I, at that point. I frankly also feel, and we can, um, we can go back to agriculture, but I feel like in some ways I had more intimate relationships with some of our customers and vendors because I got to see them more often. Right. See, yes, yeah, see them, yeah. So, you know, before it would be like one meeting a year. Right. And so then all of a sudden now that the door is open to the possibility of meeting multiple times a year and um, maybe it's not in person, but it's, it is an intimate way to, to be able to see people more often. Yeah, and maybe you don't connect with. It's putting that face to the name, right? And beforehand, if you're on the phone call or if you're saying, okay, I'll see you in a year or two years, for whatever reason, even FaceTime, like relatives and whatnot, it's just a different mm -hmm. form of connection than it is to do it over the phone and to not be able to see the person's face. You know, there's a lot of unspoken communications that occur whenever you're having a conversation with somebody that you just don't get on the side of a phone. No. You're, you're getting one form through audio whenever you're talking with somebody over the phone as opposed to every single form possible whenever you're doing a Zoom call with the exception of, you know, some actual tangible items and touching and whatnot. But it's like, it's, it's huge what it's done for business and I'm looking forward to seeing what it has an impact on the agriculture side. And it's like, we just got to do this shift and this push of educating younger people. And I think there's some great farmers in the Midwest on TikTok that do all kinds of craziness and fun stuff. And I love seeing that. And it's like, I wish we would see a whole lot more of that being here in Louisiana because we do have so many great different avenues of agriculture in Louisiana from rice to crawfish to cattle. I mean, there's so much agriculture there and is. farming business here. People don't realize how much there really is. And then just how much from the perspective, the Mississippi River really pushes down too. So all that grain from the Midwest is coming right through New Orleans, right? It's coming yeah. right through the mouth of Mississippi. And so, so much of our commerce revolves around agriculture, whether it's grown here, produced here, or shipped out of here. You know, really um, the backbone of a lot of our economy is definitely agriculture. Based. Yeah. And it's, it's, we, we've got a lot of oil and gas here in Louisiana, but we have a whole heck of a lot of agriculture too. Yeah. So was there ever a point whenever y'all were going through all of this that you were just kind of like wanting to toss up your hands and say, it's not worth it, you know, 
Oh, look, there's a lot of days. I think uh, if I relate back to the brand, though, and just kind of lessons that I have learned through this journey of trying to create a brand, um, in, we actually started in 2016. And I had named the brand Kinshaw. So it was supposed to be after my family's last name, Kennedy, right? And my dad's mentor, Mr. Frank Godshaw. It was actually from Abbeville, Louisiana. And so, you know, the attorneys had really told me, look, you know, it, you got to just pick something. Think about Xerox, right? It doesn't really mean anything. Coca-Cola doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you kind of define your own brand. And it was very difficult to find something we could trademark. And so I really struggled. I mean, we, we really tried for many years to get the brand outside of Louisiana and finally, in 2019, I was in Bentonville for a meeting with Walmart. This is like my third meeting, I think, with Walmart. And you get one chance every time, every year. So, so this, it's once a year. It's you once get a year you get a chance, right? And so here I am again, and I'd already decided in early 2019 that this was this was the last year for the brand, right? If it didn't make it, it wasn't going to make it, right? Okay. It was, it, this was it. But it spent a lot of time and effort and we really had very little distribution, and so there really wasn't, you know, a point in continuing forward. And I was in this meeting, and it was around Thanksgiving. So I mean, it's been, you know, it's kind of the end, end of the road, end of yeah, my year. You're, you're running out of and, runway. And my, here. my runway is running to an end here. And the buyer there, we were kind of in a very small room at, at Walmart headquarters. It's like these little rooms they put you in, in a little, inter, you know, interrogation kind of rooms, right? I mean, I'm not kidding. And so really you have, cold or really hot. Yeah, one of the and ways. you have a you know the timer and everything as you imagine, and you know you make your pitch and that's it. So like halfway through my pitch, um, he stops me and he's like, "Look, like you can stop." And at this point, I'm <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what? Like, I swear. And that's when I'm like, "Okay, this is bad. This is really bad. Like yeah, all, I'm going to get done. my little briefcase. I tried hard, you know." And he's like, no, I really, I really like you, and I like this concept, but I could never get that name outside of Louisiana with the AUX. It's just not going to go outside of Louisiana for me in any kind of meaningful way. And, and the package, yeah, and no, right? Like, and the packaging is terrible. Oh, okay. 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 So I was like, <laughs> okay. Not, not, not holding any punches. I'm not going to hold any punches. Said, but if you can come back by the end of December, again, it's like six weeks, right, with a new look and new brand and everything, then I will put you on the mod, which that's their reset, right? That's the grocery term um, in March. So what took us several years to build took me all of getting to the parking lot to kill, right? <laughs> and, um, and you got to start all over. Oh, yeah. Now, thankfully, you know, I had a friend that had helped me um, before with some branding, and he had already been kind of encouraging me to change the brand. But at this point, you know, we had put a lot of time and effort into this brand, and it was like, it's not going to work. I, you know, why am I going to spend the money on rebranding? And, well, you know, it, maybe this is not even worth it, those kind of things. And so all of a sudden now we had a reason to do kind of some of the things that we had already thought maybe – Maybe we should try to do. And also, again, back to that authenticity, it's about telling our story, right, is the four sisters, is, is four farm farm daughters, and not necessarily about telling the story of our father. And um, and so kind of changing that narrative um, really, I feel like, resonated with consumers too and, and helped bring, you know, people um, our age back to the farm level and get interested in agriculture and all those things that maybe they didn't realize that they would be interested in. Yeah. So just by happenstance, we, he gives us a shot. He likes the brand. Everything looks great. This is the end of December 2019. We go onto the mod in March of 2020. Perfect timing. Literally. Yeah, per that's the perfect so timing. So we also <laughs> had gotten the green light around that time for Kroger. So both Kroger and Walmart put us into distribution in the first quarter of 2020. And before yeah. that, really, I think people didn't realize that we were going to be able to kind of supply them in a large way. But we were really able to, to continue to um, supply them even through some of the toughest days. And many, many people talk about you know, toilet paper still today, but rice was just as bad. I mean, rice and beans were just flying off the shelf, you know, those pantry staples, um, cheap, right? People, people were storing them. 
And so being able to continue to restock and keep keep those shelves stocked was a really big deal from a supplier perspective. And so we earned a lot of trust through our retailers. And then people started calling me at that point saying, you know, you know, you know, do you have product? You know, can you ship? And we were able to continue to kind of expand that way. And then, you know, since then it's been just one account at a time and gaining distribution on the West coast and gaining distribution in Florida, thankfully now with Publix, it was a huge win for us. We just got into Publix. So, Lots of rice lovers down in, in Florida. Congratulations. Yeah. That's incredible. So, you know, those those are just big wins that we had early on. Also, Rouse's was a huge help. Um, they really were kind of some of the first to, to put our product um, on shelf. And then Whole Foods here in Louisiana, too. They even had Kinshaw before we changed to Four Sisters, right? So <laughs> they believed I get, you from day one. Yeah, they've been with me from day one. So I really have a, um, a big heart for the Rouse's family and... Um, and for my Whole Foods family down here in Louisiana. Um, so, you know, that's um, that's just, it's it's been a building block, you know, one account at a time and, and trying to move the needle that way. Um, in our area, Brookshire's was another, was another big one that kind of took us on. Um, but now, you know, we've expanded and we've been growing a lot um, on our digital channel as well, which has been a huge kind of leap. I mean, we're still kind of in that journey, but on Amazon and using Instacart as a way to promote and market and actually promoting products on the other dot coms like the Walmart.coms and Kroger.coms and um, you know, people are shopping different. COVID changed the way people shop. Hundred um, percent. there's more men shopping now than there was. It was interestingly enough. But before COVID it was really um, predominantly female that did most of the shopping. Now I think it was male during COVID. Interesting. Most yeah, m- yeah. most men shopped. That's kind of reversed back a little bit, but still, now that you can get your groceries delivered or you can pick them up in the parking lot, or you know, there's just lots of different ways. So it provides different different opportunities. I'll call it um, for brands like ourselves to get our messaging out to consumers and to actually promote where they are. Right, but you just have to. You have to really build out your omni-channel experience. It's, it's the technical term for it, but yeah. um, you got to look good on shelf and and in that digital cart. Well, and you have to make it, like for me, the biggest thing is ease of access for the end user. How easy can you make it for them to either 100%. purchase your product or in the case of the show, consume the show? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's as easy as you can make it is the better route to go. And it's not like creating this difficult to get to this difficult to mm-hmm. accomplish you know like we're like with the show it took me doing research and figuring out how do I get on every single platform how do I get on every single social media channel there is how do I get where it's easiest for consumers to consume whether it's radio whether it's you know Facebook or you gotta meet them where they are I have to meet and them there where are a lot at. of different places <clears throat> and everybody is everywhere so you know for me the biggest thing I tell people is you can tell your Alexa play the Patty G show and she'll play it <laughs> Like, that for me was the win. That's a win. That's it's, a huge win. Like Are you kidding? Being able to get that instant of access. You know, we went through some some setups and getting to the point where it's video is a big component. So people can then watch the show and it's not just listening. So people like it's, visual. It's talking about the different mediums. And for selling a product, if you're not on Amazon, if you're not on Instacart, if you're not on Walmart.com, if you're not where they're shopping. You don't exist. Exactly. And unless you have a really compelling reason to drive the traffic to your website, it's like, why, why am I going to stock a pond and put a fence up? <laughs> you know, why not go into That's a like larger pond or a larger ocean where everybody's already fishing and just get my product out there? Yeah, I'm going to be a little component, but at the end of the day, I'm where all the customers are. And if you're not where the customers are, you're not ever going to sell any product. Exactly. You know, and it does get complicated, especially as small business. I don't think that people quite understand um, just how many platforms there are or that they're consuming on a daily basis. And so for people like you and I, we've got to meet them there, right? So that means you got to figure out a lot of different ways. It also allows you, though, on the positive side to reach more people in a little bit less expensive way than right. it used to be, right? Through like traditional marketing and things like that. So. It's just about embracing um, embracing where your consumer is and trying to meet them there and um, to 
providing them a product that they want to consume, right? That is entertaining and, and um, in our case, tastes good every single time, cooks right, right? And that, yes. you know, they're proud to feed their families. So I think that if you really bring that product to life that, that they want, that, you know, if, as long as you're there, um, easy to access to your point, then you really have a lifetime customer. Yeah, and you have a strong chance of getting them to come back because of how easy it was. Mm -hmm. And it's... Nobody likes it. Nobody likes it to be difficult. No, and it doesn't matter what kind of product it is. It doesn't matter what you're selling, whether it's a digital good or it's a tangible good. If you make it one fraction harder than your competitor for the consumer to buy, you've either got to have a really darn good selling point and a really darn good product. Otherwise, they're going with the competitor yeah. 10 times out yeah. of 10. Yeah. And it's just... it's. It's so difficult for people to kind of recognize. Well, they can come to my website. No, oh, no, no. I'm not doing like Amazon's very tough to learn. It's very challenging to learn, as I'm sure it's you. It's not easy. Yes, but once you learn it and you're in, it's like now we see why. Yeah. You know, it's worth the time and effort. And then it takes years too, frankly. Oh, yeah. You know, it takes it. It really does. It's it's that again that persistence that never kind of giving up. You know. You're going to hit roadblocks. It's not going to be easy. I mean, Amazon makes it challenging, the fact that you have to show growth before they let you do the next step and the next step. But if you continue to kind of take it step by step, then, then absolutely it's, it's worth it. Oh, 100%. So as we kind of start to wrap up the show, we do a set list of questions we like to ask everybody. So the first one is, mm -hmm. what is something you did as a kid you wish you could still do today? You know... I wish that I could go back um, to that truck and be reading Harry Potter, you know? <laughs> I love to read, and there has been very few opportunities in the last several years um, for me just to sit down with a novel and read. And I think about that now and how I was, you know, bored in a way and how much I would give to go go back there. Isn't that crazy? I know. It's like, it's it's so quick. You go from being bored on the weekends or the evenings to recognizing you, you have no time for anything. That's right. You know, it's like my wife and I, the other day, were thinking about, you know, thought before children. We could just like pick up whenever we wanted and just go do something. You know, it was like, oh, it's Thursday night. You want to go to Nashville? Yeah. And we just get in the car and go. And now it's, okay, well, no, we can't do that because we got boom. And you just list out everything else. That has now become a responsibility, mm -hmm. a job, just something that you no longer have the freedom to do. Yeah. I'm right there with you. So what are three lessons you have learned along the way? You know, I think, number one, it's about really paying attention to the opportunities that you have in front of you, right? So um, the grass is not always greener on the other side is a great, another way to put that, right? But Sometimes the opportunity is right there in front of you, and you have to be willing to take it. And um, I think really appreciating that is important to me and, and really a huge lesson because I had no idea this opportunity to agriculture would have brought me, um, and I was very close to not kind of going down this path, and I'm so glad that I'm here now, right? So that's number one. Um, number two is just power of networking, I would say. I think that, you know, putting yourself out there is really important, especially for a young person early on. You know, I know that time is precious and you need to really, you know, make sure that, you know, your time is well spent. But I do think it's important to get yourself in front of people and to um, try to attend shows and, and do that networking. Yes, some of it, you know, you don't really know what will come from it, but maybe something two or three years down the line actually pops up that, you know, you met this person or you thought, oh, well, maybe that person can actually help me with this. And uh, I have found that that's been extremely, extremely powerful for me throughout my career. And then the third one, which we talked about a little bit, um, is really this idea of never stop running. I'm a huge believer in that. I really believe in the power of staying hungry. I think that people, people, you know, at some point get a little bit fat or content, as I call it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you kind of say, oh, well, you know, I've done all these things and, and all that's great. And look, I mean, I'm, I probably should celebrate the wins more, frankly, because, um, and you work so hard and, and it's exciting when you get one of those big fish in the line and it's, it's just incredible, right? Just, you know, the things that happen. 
but at the same time, um, that kind of always kind of hunger on the back of your mind, I think, keeps you from, you know, not resting on your laurels and kind of having the drive to, to continue because, you know, success is it, and failure, they're always around the corner from each other. So, right. um, they come hand in hand. There's many days where, <laughs> I'm, I am not, you know, I walk out of a meeting and, and, you know, didn't go my way only, you know, to get a phone call that something remarkable happened the next 15 minutes. Right. So they, they go hand in hand a lot of times. Um, and you win some and you lose some. Yeah, and that's accepting it and moving on yeah. and learning from it is all we can ever do. Absolutely. So what is something you love about Louisiana? So what I love the most about Louisiana is is that idea of culture, like right? the family table that we talked about earlier. Um, food is really, you know, at my core, right, what we do. Um, we are an agricultural company, but really we find ourselves to be a food company, right? We're providing a product that goes on your family table. And so Louisiana is just an incredible place for all things, all things culturally around food and the table and um, what we talked about earlier as far as bringing people together. And I just, I love that about Louisiana. I also think that we are totally underestimated for how incredible our outdoors are and just how incredible, you know, our weather even is. I mean, yes, we have hurricanes occasionally (laughs) and yes, it's hot in the summer and all those things. But, you know, pretty much everybody in Louisiana lives pretty close to water. Yeah. And, you know, you can go outside for, you know, not, it's not expensive to be able to, you know, use a car. We have incredible parks throughout the state. We have incredible resources at our back door to be able to, you know, go out in nature. It's the sportsman's paradise, right? Right. And so I don't think we talk about that enough, but the idea that, you know, you can be outside and enjoy the outdoors Pretty much all year long, I think, is one of my favorite parts about Louisiana. Yeah, we've got some enjoyable enjoyable weather for sure. Yeah. And yeah, the, the mosquitoes come out every now and again. You know, but I mean, nowhere is perfect 24-7. I, I'll be honest with you, I would I would take our hot summers for um, some of these Arctic blasts that I keep on hearing about. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, today, um, you know, it's it's 88 degrees. It was in Baton Rouge. It's awesome, beautiful spring day. And Oh, yeah. So I just think that, you know, the outdoors is really your backyard, mm-hmm. pretty much for all Louisianans. And, and it's, again, you know, there's access to it for all people of all different walks of life, income levels. And that kind of lifestyle, I think, leads people to be happier people. And they can get out and enjoy God's world and really kind of be out there in nature, I think, is something that is, shouldn't be underestimated. Oh, yeah. I think. COVID kind of opened up the doors to that, too, with people going on yes. their walks, being home with their families. You had to get outside because you were cooped up all day. Yeah. You didn't want to stay inside anymore. So I think, yes, getting outside and just going for a walk is just such a relaxing, reconnecting element that people often miss in a day. Yeah. So for the final question, what can I do to help you? You know, I'm just super proud to know um, that this show is really amplifying the voice of entrepreneurs. So. I appreciate, you know, you amplifying people outside Baton Rouge, too. Absolutely. And um, thinking about us up in up in North Louisiana. I know that most of your guests focus here in this in this region. So, you know, tell, tell the story more of people like me that are, you know, doing things um, outside, outside the city limits. And really, um, I think that that would be a huge win for our entire state and I think people in general need to hear you know, what really is happening in Louisiana and how awesome a place Louisiana is to live and work and grow a business and a family and all the things about. Oh, yeah. And also recognizing that agriculture is really a tech industry. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You can see it in John Deere's um, stock price, too. It is, it is yeah. not a tractor company. It is a tech company. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Meryl. I really appreciate you making the drive and coming here to Building 5 and Sitting down with me at the table, it means a lot. Thank you. Absolutely. And I look forward to having dinner. So Absolutely. Appreciate yeah. it. So we're going we're gonna to go have some chow, everybody. But thank you all so much for watching the episode or listening to the show, whatever form you're consuming us in. I'm really appreciative of your time. I know the guests are as well. We're going to make sure to link everything in the show notes about Merrill and their website where you can buy some of their amazing Louisiana-grown products. And so stick around for that and check it out in the show notes. And want to give a big, wonderful shout-out to the amazing folks that bring you this show each and every week. Hear a little bit more about them right now. Welcome to the brand new Falaya mobile app. 
We took all the same tech that's helped hundreds of people sell their well, homes themselves it and okay. packed it into an easy to use app for your phone. When you download the Fly mobile app on either the Apple or Android app store, you'll immediately be able to see the power of this game-changing tool. From the seller's dashboard, you can navigate to all the information that you need. We intentionally separated everything into key groups, such as tasks to be completed, buyer leads for your listing, and contact information for everyone involved through closing. When you get an offer on your property, you can simply review and respond all within the app. No matter where you are in the world, you'll be able to monitor everything that's going on with your property from listed to sold. It's truly the power of Falaya in the palm of your hand. Download the app and see for yourself. Falaya, it's real estate reimagined. Thank you so very much to Currency Bank, a proud sponsor of the Patty G Show. If you're looking for a business bank that fosters on three core values, relationships, service, and technology, Currency Bank is the place for you. They pride themselves on convenient, accessible, and secure online banking resources where you can manage your account balances, initiate transfers, enroll with e-statements, and more via their online portal. Between the relationships, the service, and the technology, they are going to be that partner with your business every step of the way, regardless of what you need. Currency Bank is the bank for business owners. Thank you to Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge for making this show possible. Nick Pentis is a past guest. We love having him on. Listening to him talk about the culture they have over at Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge is really an incredible thing to hear. How they treat not only their employees, but every customer that walks through the door. You are more than just a number to them. They're going to give you that white glove concierge service every step of the way. They're going to make you feel like family and take what can be a stressful time in people's life. Shopping for a car, they're going to make it so enjoyable and so pleasurable. You're going to want to go back there time and time again for every new vehicle. Thank you so very much for Mercedes-Benz of making this show possible. Imagine taxiing on a plane looking toward the end of the runway. It seems so far away. It's even hard to see it. And that's what the concept of retirement probably felt like when you were in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. Way far in the distance. Not visible or even a concern. But as you turn 50, something happens. Retirement suddenly seems like something real. Something not too far away. In your 50s, you are rolling down the runway. Retirement is getting closer and closer, faster and faster, weeks and months zipping by. But are you even ready for a successful takeoff to retirement? Fear not, there's still runway left. But the time is now. Time to make progress and time to get a plan. The Runway Decade will help you get organized, get energized, and give you the direction you need to take off to your desired retirement. The Runway Decade building a pre-retirement flight plan in your 50s. McClavey's Limited, a proud sponsor of the Patty G Show, has been serving the Baton Rouge area proudly for 40 plus years. Gentlemen and ladies, if you're shopping for your man, there is no other place in the Baton Rouge area to get your clothing, whether it's game day needs, everyday needs, business attire, formal attire, whatever you want. Go over there, see Frank and Ashley. It's a father-daughter duo. They do incredible things in their store. They will outfit you from as simply a shirt that you need for one evening or all the way to a full wardrobe overhaul. They're going to take care of you every step of the way, and be sure and let them know that Patty G Show sent you. Thank you to our wonderful sponsor, Lake Men's Health Center with our Lady of the Lake Physicians Group. Guys, I know it's tough to get out and go to the doctor. I know it's challenging to find time in our busy days, but I promise you, signing up to be a part of this group with Dr. Curtis Chastain and Dr. Tyler Boudreaux, you won't regret it for several reasons, but most of those being the fact of the time it saves, where you're able to get in on the same day, get that appointment done, and spend that time you need to talk with them about what your health goals and concerns are, as well as ensuring that the financial investments you have, you will be able to live out and see those come to fruition. So if you're an investing guy, you know all about and planning for the future and investing in the future. There's no other more important thing to invest in than your health. Make sure you go check them out, our Lady of the Lake Physicians Group Men's Health Center, and tell them Patty G sent you. Simple plan, don't want a complication. Ooh, complication. Ooh.
Oh, 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 oh,